Hello again and welcome to Pearl Magazine. All children should have equal access to sports, regardless of their abilities. Yet a recent local survey reveals that nearly half of the parents of children with intellectual disabilities feel that their kids are discriminated against on the sports field. Tonight, Pearl Magazine's Tina Jang meets a young sailor with special needs who broke the boundaries. Located on the south shore of Saikung Peninsula, Hebe Haven and the surrounding environment provide perfect sailing waters in Hong Kong. <laughs> on this Sunday morning, a group of young sailing enthusiasts are gathered at the slipway. <laughs> Today the weather is quite cold because there's a monsoon. 15-year-old Gabriel Lung has been sailing for nearly four years. Today he is preparing for his regular weekend ride. I don't like to get involved with new things. In the early days of class, I was reluctant because I had to get up so early and was so tired. It was too scary to get up so early on Sundays. But as he sailed, he gradually began to enjoy the sport. It's very comfortable to go out to sea, enjoy the wind and look at the scenery. It's great, at least better than staying at home. Gabriel's mother, Eva Kwok, is with him today to show her support. Gabriel is a child with special education needs. He suffers from ADHD as well as autism. At that time, I didn't know what autism was. So when the doctor told me the result, I shed tears unconsciously because I was a little scared of this name. For years, Gabriel's parents have been trying to understand the disease and accept that their son will be a little different. It's not like Gabriel doesn't talk, he just can't express himself very well. When he was a child, he didn't like to have contact with the outside world. When he saw strangers, he would hide behind his father and me. Or if we were going to some places, he would keep asking us where we were going. And he would be very nervous and uneasy. In primary school, I don't think he made any friends at all. There was simply no contact. When I was a kid, I thought it was okay for me to be alone. I did things by myself and played alone. I didn't really need friends. When I am alone, I might do my homework if there's any. I may not have much to do. I don't know. I might play with a pen. Sometimes I will draw something. <laughs> Because I don't do much exercise, it's actually a little difficult for me to get along with other boys. They often go to play basketball after lunch, but usually I don't go with them. I went up with them before, but I didn't score a single goal. According to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, children with disabilities should have equal access as other children to participate in play, recreation, leisure and sports activities. However, in reality, that may not be the case. Children and youth with special needs encounter significant barriers that hinder their equal participation in the community. They face varying degrees of misunderstanding and discrimination. Mabel Lowe is the executive director of a local NGO. In 2020, her organization carried out a survey on the participation in sports for youth with intellectual disabilities and found that nearly half of the parents surveyed expressed that their children were being discriminated against and 30% of them said their kids were teased when they participated in sports. Furthermore, 20% of them said their kids didn't play any sports within six months. 
Mabel believes that a lack of awareness of special education needs or send children among the general public may be the reason for the findings. Since 2012, her organization has launched an inclusive sailing program for children with special needs and mainstream volunteers to team up and sail together. This initial sailing team consisted of eight teenagers with special needs paired with eight volunteers who work together to learn sailing skills. Through this project, children with special needs have the opportunity to build teamwork friendships with mainstream volunteers. This in turn helps develop social skills, a sense of belonging and a supportive network. By providing a platform for mainstream individuals to directly engage with our children with special needs through sports, we enhance understanding and acceptance within the wider community. Gabriel has been with the project since the very beginning. And over the past several years, Mabel says he has changed a lot through sailing. He was um, very shy. And when I first met him, is he stood at the back of his father. And during the training sessions, um, it was very difficult for him to, to stay focused through intensive sailing training. He has formed close relationship with his buddy as well as his teammates. Now he is um, quite confident and he is willing to communicate and interact with um, people from diverse backgrounds. I am a bit bolder now. I used to be very scared when I was sailing. I was worried that the sailboats would capsize and I didn't know how to deal with it. But after I started playing for some time, I was no longer so scared. I recently went to Portugal to participate in the sailing competition. The wind was strong, just like Hong Kong's number 10 Typhoon signal. At that time, my boat was rolled on this side, but I was not afraid at all. Sailing requires good sense and teamwork. Without good teamwork, it would be a big deal. And I think sports is a common language that can connect people together. We only have uh, we two of the uh, men on the boat, so everything we need to tackle by ourselves and we need to take care of each other. So I think it's quite an interesting experience. Jackie Ho is a volunteer who is paired with Gabriel today. Actually, um, before talking more to him, I, I think he is quite uh, maybe shy or talking little to us. But when we start becoming a partner, he actually very proactively shared his idea with me. And he's a very cheerful boy. And especially in sailing, he is an expert. I need to uh, learn a lot from him. Children with uh, special needs, uh, they do have a lot of talent and especially like their body senses is, is even more, more comprehensive than, than our normal people. Sailing is a good way to let them know they are capable. So uh, I partake in this program to kind of as a volunteer accompany them going in the ocean and enjoy the sailing fun together. In the last few years, the NGO scaled up the project to include more sports, such as rugby and dragon boat. Since 2019, it has organized more than 400 sessions of training, benefiting more than 7,000 Sun Kids and engaging over 200 volunteers. Gabriel also became a volunteer for the program and started helping other kids in need. It gave me a lot of confidence because when I take care of people, I change from a person who takes orders to someone who gives orders. That is, I have to start to decide what I need to do on the boat. There was a sailing competition earlier. I was partnered with a peer. He is a child with mild intellectual disability. We didn't get along well because we were not able to communicate well. I tried my best to help. Even though I really wanted to win, 
I felt that I had to do it with him no matter what. Otherwise, even if I win, but he didn't participate, it defeats the purpose of inclusiveness. I think the important thing in this game is not whether you win or not, but that we go through it together and participate in it together. Gabriel's mother Eva is also grateful to see his improvements. He is more independent than before. He makes more decisions, communicates and shares more with others. He gets along with others, which is a big progress. He also knows how to arrange his own time. There are many areas of improvement. So it is a wonderful thing that he has made such great progress. I also want everyone to know that, in fact, children with special education needs have many unimaginable potentials that they can't unleash. When we return, the latest technology in film production and what you can expect to see on the big screen. Stay with us. Welcome back to Pearl Magazine. Film Art is a marketplace to sell and buy visual content for television and cinemas. Zella Chin heads to the expo to check out the cutting edge technologies used in film production and what new content will be coming to TVs and the silver screen. Norwegian Roger Preuss came to Hong Kong in 2006. He has a background in technology and design in the creative media field. He started a production studio in 2022. Hong Kong has a really rich you know, film history. There's so much creativity in Hong Kong. Even the government is putting a lot of emphasis on art tech, art and culture and so forth. But it's, it's lacking certain technologies and certain processes that for us, um, in terms of what filmmakers need, uh, it's what's called virtual production. Virtual production is a filmmaking process that places someone in a virtual environment. Welcome to our, our booth. So this is our temporary virtual production setup. It's very fancy. Um, what we have here is um, a robot. This is called motion controls. So it's all programmed and we can repeat the same shot over and over again. So now we're basically stepping into a scene. Uh, we're, now we're in a, in a very hot place. This is how it works. So basically a big LED volume can have real-time rendered graphics. When the camera moves, you can actually see that the perspective is changing in the back. We're going to do some Traditionally, some films are recorded with a green screen in the background and a video editor edits visual effects in the post-production process. Or a movie is filmed on location. That means people may have to bring large production crews to travel around the world if they need to shoot a scene in the jungle, if they need to shoot a scene in the desert or or maybe a more uh, surreal environment. They have to maybe build physical sets. And the benefits of using virtual production are? It enables you to shoot everything in studio versus going on locations, versus building large physical production sets. Uh, you can do it virtually instead. So it speeds up the process, saves money. With green screen, you have to have a much more complex post-production process. A lot of the visual effects can take a long time to produce. But again, with virtual production, you get the effects straight in camera, and that saves a lot, a lot of time. So far, Roger's company makes TV commercials and entertainment content for production houses and sports brands. He says the challenge is to get local filmmakers to adopt this technology. We need the local directors, the film directors, to start embracing it, to understand how to shoot and produce using virtual production. So it's a bit of an educational phase. If you look at worldwide, this has been going on for at least four or five years. Roger thinks there's a lot of market potential for filmmakers from Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area to make films using virtual production technology. Worldwide, this is being embraced by big production studios. Many movies are made completely using virtual production. Hong Kong, I think, will be there as well. Hong Kong is just a little bit behind. This film industry trade show is hosting 750 exhibitors from over 25 countries. They're showcasing their latest films and services, such as using generative AI to make videos. 
Baptist University experiments with new technologies in filmmaking. Gilbert Poe teaches script writing, and he has been in the film industry since the 90s. He says AI can be used in every step of film production. AI is everywhere. AI is part of our lives. It's in our phones. So it's in pretty much every part of our aspect of filmmaking. Uh, you know, from writing to producing to editing, there are softwares that uh, is helping uh, us make films uh, faster, better, cheaper. This AI tool restores an old video or image back to its original colors. Yes, we do have film restoration tools today, but it's painstakingly long because we take every frame and basically hand uh, restore every frame. So with AI, uh, we could do it a lot faster, a hundred times faster. Yeah. So when this comes out, uh, hopefully it will help other film historians restore films. You know, the script was started, I mean, almost like six years ago. Yeah, and then Director the, uh, Mandrew Kwan didn't yeah, use these new technologies to make his film. Instead, he used a traditional method and filmed on location. He is attending the trade show to raise awareness for his project. Because uh, Hong Kong nowadays, for a film like for our budget, which is a low budget, a uh, film festival would be a very good kickstart for our films. So uh, we are looking for film festivals and also other sorts of dis distribution. For example, local distributions and worldwide distribution. His film is about a former gang member who protects people living in a residential building from being harassed by other gangs. It's an action film that explores social issues. I'm thinking a lot about the city, you know, how to revitalize the city because we I think in this city, I mean, we are facing an issue that we, how the city revitalized in terms of the body and also in terms of the spirit of the people. Very well, Professor Poe says films about social issues in the city have been popular in recent years. We can't really produce big budget movies uh, because we don't have worldwide distribution. So to do something local, we need to keep the budget low. And so therefore dramas and Hong Kong real, you know, issues uh, play a big part. Hong Kong people like to see their own stories being told on screen. I think that's a very big important part of it. Mandrew's film was shot in the To Kwa Wan neighborhood with a budget of about 5 million Hong Kong dollars. He received funds from the Federation of Hong Kong Filmmakers Keep Rolling, Keep Running program. Louis Ku, the president of the organization, created the initiative. It was originally started from uh, Louis Ku, who thought that because during the COVID, um, the whole industry basically stopped and he wanted to do something to help the industry to revitalize. So in this case, he asked some donor for money and then also opened up for pitching for a project. So at the end, there's two projects that were selected. Uh, I'm one of them. The market size for Hong Kong filmmaking shrank from 831 million U.S. dollars in 2019 to 735 million U.S. dollars in 2020 during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the film industry still hasn't recovered to the pre-pandemic level. Producer Sophia Sheck travels between Hong Kong and the U.K. developing films. She has been attending this trade show for 10 years. It's always good to come back and see familiar faces and stay current. So I think uh, people who see me here, first question they say, oh, when did you get back? So um, that it, feels, it feels like home when I come here. Sophia says this fair is quieter than the ones held in previous years. She thinks that investors and in content, such as streaming platforms, are more selective nowadays. Now that we're coming out what we call post-pandemic, I, I feel like people want to travel. They want to reconnect with people. And I think um, we don't watch as much um, TV, streaming platforms and films like before. And so, I feel that that has made um, the streaming platforms look at content differently as well.
So I think I feel like they're a bit more careful at selecting their projects uh, uh, to fund. Over the decades, filmmaking activities in the city have slowed down. Back in the 80s, uh, you know, theaters uh, was the main thing, and we were the uh, sort of like the Hollywood of Asia type of thing, right? We were producing hundreds of films, as you know. Um, so today, I think it's a bit more diversified. Every country is making their own movies, per se. Despite the decrease in film productions in the SAR, students are still eager to enter the creative industries. Gilbert Poe is in charge of the Higher Diploma Program in Creative Film Production at Baptist University. He says enrollments have remained steady at 200 students per year for the last few years. So many of our students, right after graduation, they go into the film industry or the advertising industry or the, you know, a media company and they start working right away. Uh, many decide to continue their education. None of our students have a problem getting a job if they want to. In an era where content can be watched in movie theaters and on mobile phones, Professor Poe advises would-be filmmakers to make good stories to be successful. What we need to do is to find a way, interesting way, to touch people's hearts. No matter if it's one minute or 10 hours long, that's how you, you, you engage the, the, the consumers, you engage the audience that way. Well, Hong Kong may no longer be the Hollywood of Asia. Professor Po feels that locally made films still have an important role to play in the global film market. The films we make in Hong Kong, when they go out into the world, in a way they are ambassadors for us, right? And so therefore, the Hong Kong government uh, should support continuously for our efforts to make quality films that could be shown uh, overseas, worldwide, so people can understand and know Hong Kong better. I think that's the goal of us, what we try to do, representing Hong Kong. That's our show for this week. Join us on Pearl Magazine, same time next week. Bye for now.